just so everybody's aware of kind of what our next hour, hour and a half to two hours is going to look like, Rob is going to share with us a little bit of background on exoplanets. He's an uh, exoplanet researcher himself. And then Mary and myself will tell you a little bit about the Microobservatory Robotic Telescopes. And then we're actually going to get to use them today uh, in our DIY Planet Search Portal. And you're going to get to detect an exoplanet as a group. We're going to do that together today, which is really exciting. Uh, after you get to learn how that portal works, Rob's also going to tell us a little bit about ExoWatch, uh, Exoplanet Watch, which is uh, a, a deeper iteration if you have access to your own telescopes or, you know, potentially some access through microobservatory as well uh, to contribute to some of the research that he is doing. So you get a whole slew of different uh, ways to learn about and engage in exoplanet research uh, and discoveries. So Rob, I'll let you kick it off and tell us a little bit about exoplanets. Thanks, Erica. So hi, everyone. I'm Rob. Thank you for the nice intro, Erica. I uh, appreciate it. So I'll be talking today about exoplanets or finding life in the galaxy. So I'm calling you from uh, JPL in Southern California. I heard Mary saying that the entire New England area is covered in rain, so I will not tell you about today's weather. It's nice. Sorry, Mary. So working at NASA JPL, um, here's actually a photo of little Rob. This has actually been something that I've always wanted to do. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I've always loved space and space science and, and NASA. So I'm um, meeting my hero, the astronaut at Kennedy Space Center. A lot of people ask me if I ever wanted to be an astronaut when I was growing up as a kid. And the answer is a hard no. I'm deathly afraid of heights. And that's kind of a requirement to be an astronaut. So I'm the second best thing. I am an exoplanet astronomer. So let's sort of unpack what this jargon means. Well, exoplanet, that is actually just short for something called extrasolar planet. And extrasolar means anything beyond our solar system. So anything outside of our own solar system. Then a planet. That is a planet, so hopefully you know what that is. So an exoplanet is any planet outside of our own solar system. And then I'm an astronomer, and you guys probably all know what this is. This is someone who stares at their sky, or more likely their computer for way too long. And at JPL, what I'm trying to do is answer this ultimate question, are we alone in the universe? And to do that, we have to basically find the places that life could exist, such as a planet outside of our own solar system, determine if that planet could support life, by having the right atmospheric uh, composition, like the right molecules, the right atoms, and then uh, determine it's the right temperature, the right location, the right size. And then from there, uh, you can actually look for signs of life. But um, the, the study of exoplanets is actually a relatively new field in astronomy. It's one of the youngest fields. It's only about 15, 25 years old, depending on how you count. And despite plant exoplanets and the study of exoplanets being relatively new, the idea of life outside of our galaxy or planets outside of our own solar system is actually something that's been around for hundreds of years. So Giordano Bruno, which is 16th century philosopher who postulated the existence of other planets outside of our own solar system. He's the uh, Emperor Palpatine looking guy at the top right here. And then Isaac Newton, you know, the founder of Fig Newtons said in Principia, his book where he actually described his theory of, of gravity said, and if the fixed stars are the centers of similar systems, they will all be constructed to a similar design. In other words, there's eight planets here in our solar system, eight because Pluto's not a planet, okay? Eight planets in our solar system. And it stands to reason that if there are planets orbiting our own sun, when we go out in the night sky and we look up, that it stands to reason that there's other planets orbiting around those stars as well. And we know now, hundreds of years later, that these two dead guys are absolutely correct. Exoplanets are actually pretty much everywhere. As our technology gets better, as we know where to look, how to look, and, and process the data and how to do the observations, we have been discovering more and more exoplanets every single year. And now we know today that there are at least as many planets as there are stars in the sky due to efforts by spacecrafts such as NASA's Kepler mission. So I'm talking today about how to detect planets and putting that into context of the microobservatory and also the James Webb Space Telescope as well. But if we want to find a planet, there's actually a problem we have to overcome. It's actually really difficult to see exoplanets. They're much cooler, much smaller, much dimmer than their host star. And they're super far away, 
hundreds of light years in some cases. And since they're so, so far away, we typically only see the star that that planet is orbiting. The star is bright, planet's dim. So we either need a way to block out the star's light, or we need to use other methods to indirectly infer that that planet is there. And there's actually a ton of ways we can use to find exoplanets. And the one I'll be focusing on today, this morning slash afternoon, is the transit method. This is the method that the microobservatory uses to detect and observe exoplanets. So let's quickly talk a little bit about the transit method. So the transit method, this measures the change of brightness as a planet passes in front of its star. So for observing a star, if we're lucky, a planet will be orbiting around it. And if we're super lucky, that planet will actually pass in front of the star, block out the star's light, and cast a little shadow effectively on the Earth, hundreds of light years away. And the amount of light that that planet blocks out from its star tells us how big the planet is relative to its host star. The bigger the planet, the more light it, it blocks out. The smaller the planet, the less light it blocks out. But at best, this dip in brightness is typically on the order of about 1%. But it's really important because this gives us, again, the size of the planet relative to its star. And then as I'll be talking about in a few slides, this also allows us to study a planet's atmosphere. We can actually observe as the planet passes in front of the star and the atmosphere of the planet actually absorbs some of the star's light. And depending on how the planet's atmosphere absorbs light at various wavelengths of light, we can actually back out the composition of the planet without even having to go there. And the transit method has actually been used very, very successfully uh, to discover actually a majority of the exoplanets we know of to date. It's discovered about 3,000 of the currently 4,000 that we know of. So for the transit methods, there's actually some advantages of this method versus other ones. It's actually relatively cheap. I saw online that someone posted on Reddit a few years ago, they actually use a little DSLR camera with a barn door tracker and were able to observe an exoplanet. And then as you'll hear from uh, Mary and Erica in a few minutes, you can actually use the microobservatory, a single six inch telescope to observe uh, tens, if not hundreds of transiting exoplanets yourself, which is pretty cool. Uh, disadvantages of the transit method is there's actually a bias towards larger planets because the bigger the planet, the more light it blocks out, the bigger the signal it has, the easier it is to see. There's also sometimes false detections like solar flares and stellar flares that can sort of masquerade as a planet. Also, you have to have this perfect geometry. If you have a planet orbiting in this plane with respect to you, the observer, the planet will block out some of the star's light. But if the planet is orbiting around its star perpendicular to us, it'll never pass in front of the star and we'll never see that transit. So there's some targets we're actually missing using the transit method. But <clears throat> this method has been used very successfully, as I noted, by multiple ground-based surveys, by also multiple uh, space-based telescopes. And one that is currently flying right now that is actually discovering exoplanets is NASA's TESS, or the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. This is a full sky uh, satellite that is dedicated to searching for exoplanets using the transit method. And it's been launched a few years ago, and it's now just revisiting and going around the entire sky mapping, taking lots of photographs to discover uh, new planets that are orbiting around their star. So you might be asking, you know, if we've already discovered 3,000 transits, why do we need a mission like TESS? Well, it's because TESS is actually looking for targets that are amenable for follow-up with missions like the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, and also next generation missions. So already the Hubble Space Telescope, which is designed in the 70s and 80s and launched in the early 90s, even before the first exoplanet was ever discovered, it has still been used to, uh, to characterize the atmospheres of tens of planets, about 50 or so planets. The James Webb Space Telescope, which will hopefully be launching at the end of this month in just a few weeks, uh, when that is uh, commissioned and launched, it's predicted that it'll look at tens to hundreds of planets. <clears throat> and then next generation missions, there's one by the European Space Agency called Ariel. This is a mission dedicated to looking at and characterizing exoplanets. And that'll be looking at hundreds to a thousand planets. And then after that, there is actually a decadal review 
by a, a board of astronomers. And basically what they do is they sort of map out the next 10 years to direct NASA where to go. And they released a, port of, a report a few weeks ago that recommended that a next generation mission launched in the 2040s um, will be used and made to actually look at exoplanets. And my gut feeling is that it'll definitely be used with the transit method to observe exoplanets. So the transit method is well established in our community. It's also definitely here to stay and will be around for many, many years to come. So let me just get to my next slide. I gotta do some scrolling. But you know we're really excited about the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. And as I mentioned, this will be observing uh, potentially up to 200 transiting exoplanets. The reason why we're all very, very excited about James Webb is uh, for exoplanets, mostly two different reasons. One is its sensitivity. Hubble Space Telescope has a mirror diameter of about two and a half meters or so, whereas the James Webb Space Telescope is on the order of about six meters. So that's about 20 feet across. It's an absolutely giant telescope. It's so big that here's the uh, sun radiation shield on the bottom of the telescope, that purple thing. That's actually the size of a full tennis court. This telescope is so big that it actually can't fit inside the nose fairing of its rocket. So they actually have to fold it up like some really intricate origami to get it to fit inside of the nose cone. Then when it's launched, it'll take a few months actually to completely open and unfurl and to get to its destination. So these next few months will be followed very, very closely by um, everyone really in the astronomy community. And James Webb also um, provides a lot more uh, wavelength coverage than the Hubble Space Telescope. As I mentioned before, Hubble was launched in the early 90s, you know, a few years before we even discovered the first exoplanet. James Webb <clears throat> will have a lot more wavelength coverage that's more amenable to characterizing the atmospheres of these exoplanets. So I've been talking a lot about how we can actually characterize the atmospheres of planets, but how do we do that? And we use something called Beer's Law. So let's uh, look a little bit more into the definition of what Beer's Law is. That is studying for work or doing homework while beer is involved, making difficult classes such as physical chemistry more bearable. That's a good definition of Beer's Law. I definitely did this as a graduate student, but the real one is this. Let's take a light bulb and let's put it in front of a chamber full of gas, like methane gas. Then let's look at the light from that light bulb at the other side of the chamber. We would naturally expect that light to look a little bit dimmer. And that is because the gas is causing the light to be absorbed or scattered out of your uh, line of sight. And it actually scatters according to this fairly simple equation right here at the top right. But in other words, what we can do is we can use Beer's law to compare what we see to what we think we should see. And we can back out the composition of the thing that is absorbing that light. In other words, it, let's say we look at a yellow star with an astronomer with a telescope, right? We would expect that yellow star to have yellow light. However, if there is a gas cloud in between us and that star, then that star's light, which is originally yellow, will actually look a little bit more red. And then what we can do is if we observe what an object does look like and then compare it to what it should look like, we can actually use Beer's law to determine the composition of the absorber. And we can say that that gas cloud, for example, has molecules in its atmosphere. And the same thing holds true for planets. If we're looking at a planet, you know, this planet, for example, has a really hot core left from when it formed. That hot core is gonna radiate some light outwards, but the outer layers of its atmosphere are a little bit cooler than the inner part of the planet. So that light actually changes color a little bit. And then, Astronomers at the other side of the telescope can then say that planet has methane in its atmosphere just by using Beer's law. And also look at how a planet reflects light. <clears throat> so in our own solar system, Jupiter takes some of that yellow light from our sun. But since Jupiter has clouds and molecules in its atmosphere, it reflects light at a slightly different wavelength. And it reflects it more as a red light. So astronomers at the end of those telescopes can say, hey, that planet has clouds in its atmosphere. So Beer's law is really important because it allows us to characterize an exoplanet's composition by observing how it emits, absorbs, and reflects light. In other words, we can actually use light to characterize these planets to figure out what they're made out of without ever having to go visit them, which is great because they're at least three light years away. And uh, that's a long round trip to characterize a planet's atmosphere. 
So I think that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about. Do we take any questions, Erica, or we just for, go forge onwards? Yeah, I think we can take a couple questions. Sure. Okay. Take a pause, make sure everybody's got the same understanding of exoplanets. That was a great um, uh, uh, explanation. Thank you for that. So is it the different, the diff, um, so why, why when you saw the, Plut the um, Jupiter and it turned into red and you said clouds and the other one you turned into red and it said methane? Yeah, it depends on the wavelength of light that you're looking at. Let's see, so for this one, um, methane, absorbs most strongly in infrared wavelengths. So it sort of depends on the wavelength you're looking at. At these infrared wavelengths at three microns to be exact, um, that's where methane gas is absorbing light. So if we see a, a change in the brightness at those wavelengths, we can tell what it's made out of. And I can't show infrared light on here because we don't see an infrared, so I used red as a stand-in. And then for the clouds portion, this is actually redder light in the visible end of the spectrum. So we could actually see this with our own eyes. That's a great question, thanks. Great, thank you. Well, there'll be other opportunities for questions later too, so. And I'm monitoring the chat box as well as we go through. So if anybody has any questions as, as, they, um, as they come up, feel free to ask them in the chat box. Oh, we have one now. Um, joining the detecting, other than estimating the size of the planet, the size of the, to join, sorry, I was a bit late to join in the transit method of characterizing and detecting the exoplanet, other than estimating the size of the planet, about the size of the orbit. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Let me just get my animation back up here. One quick second. There we go. And actually, we'll dive into that even a little bit when we dive oh. into DIY. But show us your animation, and then we'll we'll double see it. Perfect. Yeah. So um, you're absolutely right. It does tell us information about the orbit as well. The uh, speed as it orbits around the star tells us also its distance. Uh, things that are farther out tend to orbit more slowly than things closer in. And we can also back at other parameters like the, um, the distance from the planet to the star, the inclination of its orbit, the eccentricity of its orbit, how much it deviates from a, a round circle, um, and other parameters such as that. So the transit method is actually really important. Great question. All right, Mary, I think you have some slides to show I and do. get us started introducing micro observatory before we dive into actually trying it ourselves. Yep, I do. Um, let me share my screen here and I'm gonna share my second screen. So I'm kind of looking over this way, excuse me for that, but um, okay. And I'll see that we uh, do this and I'll put it on slideshow here. So hopefully at this moment, everyone is seeing um, uh, and please uh, confirm Erica, everyone is uh, seeing my slide DIY plan to search. I see him. All right. So um, with that background, great background that Rob gave, um, it's now time for you to learn how you can participate in um, exoplanet learning uh, and science uh, and, and even contribute to the research. Um, and so uh, what you'll need is um, a telescope. And it turns out that we have some telescopes that collect data almost every night. Uh, of exoplanet targets. And they are the micro observatory uh, robotic network of telescopes. Um, we, they're, they're six inch aperture. So they, they're you know, small telescopes. Um, and you can see they actually sit out in the weather. They're weatherproof. So they collect data, rain or shine. So uh, one of the things as you learn your instrument, um, you'll, you'll uh, realize that some nights the data is just terrible because it was cloudy, um, but, uh, but the dedicated exoplanet telescope is in Arizona at the uh, Fred Whipple Observatory, so uh, it, it at least has better weather than here in Cambridge. Um, 
or New England. Okay, so you'll need the micro observatory telescope. And um, basically these telescopes, uh, if you haven't used them, um, there's a network of uh, five telescopes, typically three to five are online at any given time. Um, you access them at a uh, uh, simple URL is microobservatory.org. And not only can you study exoplanets with them and, and uh, collect exoplanet data, but you can actually take lots of uh, images of the solar system objects, deep space objects, do some astrophotography. And there's uh, lots of tutorials um, at that microobservatory.org. But you can see they run, they, they are automated. You basically, um, they run through their requests every night as the sun goes down um, without a human in the loop. Um, but what we're gonna do for um, uh, today is we're gonna do just as Rob talked about, we're gonna use the transit uh, method. Um, to see if we can detect the telltale dimming of a star. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, to tell the telltale dimming of a star, um, that's the signal that a planet passed in front of it. Now, uh, these models and the little movie that Rob showed make it all look so simple, um, but of course, uh, this is the actual data you get back from the telescope, okay? It's a, you have, you have an image with uh, hundreds, uh, maybe thousands of stars in it, and you have to figure out which of these stars is the planet you're examining, or the star you're examining, um, and, and which might host uh, a planet going in front of it. Now, um, in, in uh, DIY planet search, uh, this is the method you'll will will go through, um, uh, and these are the things you need to uh, kind of do and know. You have to, uh, in order to be able to schedule your observations, you have to be able to predict uh, how how bright the star is going to be for your exposure and and when it's going to uh, when it might experience that transit. Now I put a star next to that um, bullet point because. Um, that's one thing we're going to help you a lot with. We've we've already done the scheduling and uh, predicting of what stars are going to have a transit going in front of them when uh, to to kind of help you uh, have some early assured success here. Um, but we're right in the next twenty minutes. We're going to um, grab a bunch of images of a target alien solar system. Now. They'll be taken a few nights ago because I don't want to have to wait during, till for tonight to go by and do this tomorrow. So we're going to use data from a few nights ago. Um, and then we're all going to, as a group, measure the star's brightness in each of those. I'm going to show you how to make the measurement on each of those images. And we're going to kind of split up the images among us so that we can uh, try and do this um, uh, efficiently. Um, then we're, uh, we're gonna graph our results. We're gonna display our results on a graph and we're gonna see if we can figure out the size based on the data, based on the dip in the light. And so that's, um, uh, and, and if we're lucky and we get a good graph, maybe we'll actually publish our results to the DIY Planet Search uh, community page. And so um, we'll see how that goes. All right, so. Uh, again, in, um, we're gonna we're gonna look at the calendar, schedule the target, get the telescope images, measure the brightness, interpret our data, and then share on the community results. Um, so here's where you have to be um, kind of uh, facile at um, having your zoom open while um, and making the, the zoom screen kind of tiny because I won't put anything on there that you need to see too, too well so that you can have a browser window open, okay? So, uh, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> ah, where am I? Okay, there we go. So the, the, the um, URL you wanna go to in your browser window is this one here, I've made it short. Uh, 
bit bit.ly slash DIY group one. Okay. And so you want a browser window open. Um, uh, bit.ly DIY group one. And I've already gone ahead and made an, a, a group account for us. So I'm going to show you how to log in to the DIY planet search site. After this uh, workshop, you'll be able to, you can um, create your own individual account, but I've uh, put you all in a group. Um, and so the first thing is you want to make sure that in the upper left of your browser, it says DIY planet search testing because you guys are using this, this kind of not quite public version of the DIY Planet Search um, site. So make sure it says testing and I wanna make sure it does for everyone. And so uh, to sign in, you're gonna click on this group member sign in button here. So you wanna click on that and then you'll get a little pop-up that looks like this, okay? And um, my, uh, so my, I'm the group leader here and my uh, group leader email address is mdusalt at cfa.harvard.edu. Now for your username, how many people have we got here? I'm gonna, Erica, I'd like you to keep track of, um, uh, I'm, I'm about to assign people numbers. And if you can quick write down who's got what number. Okay, <laughs> or or somehow you gotta type it. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> yeah, or maybe type it right in the chat so everybody can refer to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. So, Sorry, Mary, I was automatically directed to Harvard EDU Micro Observatory. Is that the wrong? And they asked me to sign in. I don't see the group um, member sign in option. Oh, uh, I'm okay. gonna I'm gonna disable the the security, Mary. Uh, one second. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, I yeah, so that way uh, nobody is required for the initial password for the group. Okay. Our testing uh, portal has an extra password on it. So you're the first one of the first groups to use our our um, ed, our group portal. Our public portal people have been using for a little while now, but the group portal is still kind of very brand new to do it all together at once. Um, so. It's behind an extra firewall wall. And uh, it's yeah. Yeah, it, sh it should be disabled right now. The firewall should be disabled. So if uh, anybody- So if you go to this bit.ly DIY group one and you um, refresh the page, you should get to um, a page, a page that um, looks like this, but has the word testing up here. Yes, got it. Thanks. Is everybody there? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alan, for realizing what was going on. I. Okay. So you want to click on the group member sign in, click on this little button. And then um, you need three credentials. The first one is my email address because I'm the group leader. The second one is your username. And I'm going to go through right now. And um, Bronwyn, you're going to be Planet Hunter one, Planet Hunter one, initial cap P, initial H, Planet Hunter one. Um, uh, George, you're gonna be Planet Hunter two. Uh, Rob, you're gonna be Planet Hunter three, if you're doing this. Fred, you'll be Planet Hunter four. Ryan, you'll be Planet Hunter five. Richard, Planet Hunter six. SPG, Planet Hunter 7, Doris, Planet Hunter 8, Lori, Planet Hunter 9, Dean, Planet Hunter 10. I have two Lori's. Okay. Well, <laughs> and um, if anyone wants to play, take another one. So your second credential is um, Planet Hunter and your number with an initial cap P and H. And then your password to get in is going to be your number followed by Alien Worlds with exactly the capitals and digits I have here. So capital A, 
L-I-E-N, capital W. The O in worlds is a zero. And I'm trying to satisfy, uh, even though I'm telling you all the passwords on a live Zoom here, I'm trying to, and so. Okay, Brian is in, excellent. I can't get in. Uh, Rob. I know, I'm a troublemaker. Okay, what number are you? Uh, supposed to be three. Three. So you want to um, uh, put in my email address. Your group member username is Planet Hunter 3 initial capital P and a capital H. And your password is 3, capital A-L-I-E-N, capital W-0-R-L-D-S, exclamation point. Am I in? Could you check? Uh, Aladdin can check. Uh, Aladdin, if you want to um, unmute yourself and. Um, uh, yeah, um, I can't. I can't see the if the user logged in or not. To be honest, so, okay. to know that if, you're in in the upper right, you'll hand... see right here. Um, this is what it should look like. You'll see a little a little astronaut. Actually, Planet Hunter One, you'll get to see a daisy. Um, brown one but anyway plan out um you should see a little icon up here is there anyone who hasn't gotten in uh yeah i'm getting a correct email password combination all right well, i'm still trying to get in i okay. don't think i am in yet all right so i'm going to do this live on my screen here whips here. and everybody uh, i put mary's email into the chat in case you're spelling that wrong. Sometimes that happens. All right. I'm going to. Um, are uh, Erica? Are you? Um... And Erica, would you be able to put like the actually the username with the X and the password? I could send them to each person. Actually, you're right. Um... So Rob, I'm going to try yours here and see. So you were group member three. Yep. See if I can get in as group member three. And maybe I did something wrong when I created that account. Uh, Planet Hunter three. Three. Um, yeah, I don't know, Rob. My computer just hates me today. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, we're going to type. Type the uh, here. So I'm in the chat. Mary, want to do it one more time, but real slow. The we'll log in and out. Okay. So each of you could copy <laughs> the password that I just put in there and switch the three with whatever your number is. That was the part I was missing. Okay. I thought it was X, not ah. my my number. Sorry. Yeah, you have to change Al the X. We're using and algebra the, here. <laughs> and both the pass and the username and the password, you have to change the X for the number that you are. Okay. So for instance, George, your planet hunter two, and your password will be two alien worlds. Oops. Right. So now, is everybody in? They have something that probably looks like this, where they're on the home page. They look up here, and you see Planter Hunter, your number. Not Planter Hunting. Planet. Sorry. Thank you. Here I think I'm, Mary. I think a few folks I've are lost my mind. All right. I think a few folks are still following up. Okay. Um, if you want to use the, I'm going to log in as. Raise your hand or any other thing to let me know if you're still struggling. I can try and help you individually. Remember, you put Mary's also, password in. Hey, Erica and Mary, I wonder if you could maybe if you it could it work if you just shared your screen and did it. Just Am I not sharing one. my screen? Screen? No, you I are. See. But I'm just saying, if you're logged into the system and just we can watch you do. The, yeah, that's what I'm going to do right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. no, but Bron, Bronwyn, everybody's going to participate and 
Everyone yeah. gets to detect the Everyone, of themselves. I need you all to do the measurement because I because in the next 10 minutes, we're actually going to create a light curve together. So I need you all to get in there. It's too many for one I person to do that. I quickly. can't make 10 measurements in the next 10 minutes. I really want 20 measurements. So I want us each to make two. But if each of you makes two, we can do it. Okay, so I'm going to show you how. 29, so see how Mary has her, her email, and that's the email everybody's going to use in the top login. In the, in the username, she's used the Planet Hunter and then put the number she's been assigned next. And then in her password, you can't see it. But that but same 20 29 Alien Worlds with the capital A capital W and a zero. Do we have ah. any, <laughs> now what if you typed wrong? <laughs> right. Okay, sorry. So I, all right. So I decided to use a different computer and I got into the sign in page. It does not even have a group member signing option. Remember <laughs> on the bottom, it doesn't have a group member sign in option. No, no. It just says don't have an account, sign in or forget your, yeah, so I, I don't know what happened. It's uh... most probably it's uh, most probably it's actually the live uh, site. Yeah, you or... need to you need to go in the upper left. Does it say testing DIY planet search testing? Oh, uh, I guess not. All right. So did I have the wrong address? Yeah. So yeah. in your URL bar, you're Make typing sure you bit.ly slash DIY group one. Oh. And then you should see the word testing. That is where our current group portal is. That's not, this group portal is not live and we're all gonna do it together. The regular portal is live, but the group portal is just special for, you're our, one of our first testing groups. So when you click the login, you see this, you click on group member sign in, you put in my you put in your group member username, planet under and I'll no, 15 and then 15 alien w0 R L D S exclamation point. And then George, did you, George, did you get you in? You should see your number up here. When you're in, you everyone should see Planet Hunter number up here in the upper right. Is everybody there? Is there anyone who's not there yet? Actually. So my the other computer I previously I said I did not see the page, but then it it seems I am logged in because the option is to log out. Okay, so, so what's the, what's the? I, I still just get the uh, your initial page. Um, why should what I have? Mary, I have. Can you shrink your screen left to right a little bit? Are you asking me to do this? Yeah. See how that appears differently now? Uh, I think because many people are doing this on a one computer, they have their browser have shrunk up and they're not seeing their login. Okay, so here- It's responsive. <laughs> it's responsive to the size of your browser window. So if you click on that little bunch of lines up there, you should over here, you'll see if you're logged in. I see. Okay. Realizing that might be some issues there. <laughs> you have it shrunk down. It looks different. Yeah. So which one should I click? So I am in. Oh, perfect. So, perfect. so is every so is everyone in now? Is anybody else still struggling? Brian, Fred, I'd like a positive. Brian's, Brian's in. in. All right. Fred, are you in? I think you were four, Planet Hunter four. 
All right, well, I'm gonna now demonstrate how to make a measurement. Okay, so each of you wants to go to DIY tools and you'll see, you'll be at the start of the process where you have to schedule your target. You have to say, which alien solar system are we all gonna to do together? And we're gonna, since we're here on the 11th and this doesn't get observed until WASP 50 doesn't get observed till tonight. And on Thursday, it was cloudy. We're gonna go back and we're gonna take the Hat P32 data set. So you wanna click on Hat P32. And, um, whoops, uh, sorry about that. If you click on observe, click on the word observe and you'll get to this page, which is telling you that we had observations between six and 11 PM at night in Arizona. And I want each of you to only take one hour's worth of observations, okay? So, um, Bronwyn, you can take the 6 p.m. hour and click all the minutes in that hour. Our telescopes take images every three minutes, so basically 20 images an hour. And I don't want you guys to have all 100 images over the five hours. So, uh, George, if you want to take the 7 o'clock hour, you'll get 20 images. Click all minutes, and then you click, um, just use the default exposure and filter for these images. In the future, we, we may have some options depending on the star, but right now use the default. And then when you click on take image, you want to get to the point where you get this confirmation, 20 images were requested for the target hat P32. So Rob, you can do the eight o'clock hour. Brian, you can do the nine o'clock hour. SPG, you can do the 10 o'clock hour. Doris, you can do the 11 o'clock hour. And Lori, you can do the nine o'clock hour too. And anyone who I didn't assign yet can take the nine o'clock hour. <clears throat> Since, okay. So, is there, um, has everyone- okay, what, what is the, Mary, what is the first thing I, on the, on the screen do I, I click, is it schedule? Yeah, schedule target. Then you wanna observe Hat P32 on December 5th from last Sunday, because that's the most recent data set that's a, that where it was clear. So you click on observe, and that will get you to the choose time. And this is basically saying, okay, the images that are gonna wind up in your account, Planet Hunter 15, are whatever what ones you choose here. If you're doing it individually, you might choose all hours and that takes all hundred images for you. But I want each of you to not have all hundred images here. So Planet Hunter 15, if I get the tenor, I, I could just take, I have, uh, 10 o'clock, I could just take 10.03, and then it would take one image for me. So, okay. All right, Ron Ron one's got her images. And George has got his, all right. So now, is there anyone who doesn't have their images? Cause it's important that we have like at least three people who have gotten to this where they get this green thing. Rob's got them. I've got okay. some. Okay. Brian's, Brian's got, got it. All right. 
And I think I saw it that George had them at some point. I am so lost. Oops. Okay. <laughs> George. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm doing the same hours, George. So I'll okay. help there. And George can watch for now. If, and I can continue to okay. try to help you in the chat box. So the next step is to open up one of those images and learn how to measure the target star's brightness. So we're going to go to measure brightness. That's right here. Okay, and you should get a page that looks like this and you wanna scroll up so that the main window where you're gonna load your image, you can see the whole thing, okay? And under my requests, you should see hat P32. And when you click the little arrow, you'll see this list of images. And depending on which, which hour, this, this funny number is actually the exact time each image was taken. Hat P32, uh, 2021 on December 1206, universal time at 020912 universal time. So you don't have to know that, but I'm just telling you each, each image. So you want to open up the first image in your list. I'm going to click on it here. And you should see an image that looks like the image I showed you in the, earlier in the slideshow, a bunch of dots on it. And then it has five colored circles, okay? Can people raise their hand if they've got a image with five circles in on their screen? Yes. Okay, we've got a few, all right. So now we have to figure out, oh my goodness, which of these dots is our target star? Um, so it turns out uh, you want to know a little bit about your image. Um, if you um, click on Finder, we provide this handy little see-through target matcher. And you can see it has a T with a little arrow um, and you have to be a pretty good pattern matcher, but the thing that really stands out to me is this little curve of four stars right in the middle of the image, and it's here. Okay, so if I get these matched up, oh, I'm pretty close now, right? I can get And you may even want to zoom in your whole screen. If you click this zoom in button, then the thing is much bigger, but you can kind of see here and match it. See, so there's my target star. And your finder, this finder image, this overlay has a T and two Cs. This is going to take us a little bit to make our first measurement, but then after that, it goes much quickly. So you want to put the yellow circle, which is a measuring circle over the target star, the one said T. You want to put the first the kind of purpley, um, circle over the first comparison star. You want to put the second circle over the second comparison star. 
because you're going to compare the brightness of the target star that supposedly is dimming because a planet's going in front of it. You're going to compare its brightness to two other stars that supposedly don't have planets going in front of them, right? Otherwise, how would you know whether it's a planet going in front of it or a cloud just went by? So <clears throat> then there's two other circles that you have to place. And that's, um, you want those to have no star in them. You want them to be on the dark background sky. And I'll explain that in a minute. So I like to get them up near the target star just so they're, they're kind of measuring the dark sky brightness near the target star. So people should have something that looks like this. And once you, once you have them even close, you can kind of close your overlay so you can see it better. And you can, this, like this one here, I don't really have that exactly circled over my, um, over my star. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna click on this little checkbox here for the orange one and use these arrows to move it over. Or you can just click on the click on the circle and use the arrows on your keyboard to move it up and down to get it centered. So once you have your target star and two comparison stars circled, it should look like this. Does anybody have something that looks like this? Anybody who hasn't never done this before, Brian's got it. And Mary, uh, the yep. I don't know if you want to explain the dark. Yeah, I'm oh, going to. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yep. <clears throat> so, um, what these circles are doing is measuring the brightness values of all the pixels inside the circle. So you can see here inside the yellow circle, my uh, target star adds up all these brightness values. And again, like if I put it right over here, seven, so it's adding up 723 and 1401, and it's adding up all the pixel values in there and getting 28,000. But look, these two circles that seem to have uh, nothing in them, right? No star, are still at 22,000. So even the dark night sky has some brightness associated with it. Even the dark night, right? Because it's, there's, there's light being scattered. Um, but there's also signal coming from the detector itself. And we have to subtract that out. That's called calibrating. And if you click the calibrate button now, you'll get an error saying, okay, please open a dark to subtract from this image. Basically the telescope has taken in, remember in your list, you had these two images that say dark. So you have to open one of them to tell the software, subtract this image when you calibrate. And this is all the noise that's from the telescope itself. This is an image taken just before your science images were taken with the shutter closed. So this is all signal coming from the telescope. This is noise. And so you wanna subtract the noise from the signal so go back, once you open up the dark, go back to that first image. And now notice what happens when I hit calibrate. Right now, as I move my cursor around the back, every pixel is around 300, every dark pixel. And you can see I have 22,000 inside those dark night sky circles. I'm gonna hit calibrate, one, two, three, calibrate. Ah, now instead of 20,000, I only have 1,700. See, I've subtracted. And 
each pixel value, I've subtracted all that noise from the detector itself. Now I'm actually ready to make my measurement. You should have something around for this star, the value one point something, something, zero, something. Ah, nice, Brian. Excellent. So now you're ready to hit calculate and record. And when you hit calculate and record, it takes a while for your measurement and you'll get a green confirmation the data has been recorded. Now we're gonna check, because it looks like Brian's done it and I've done it, it looks like Rob's done it. Is there anyone else who's made a measurement? I'm still working on mine. Okay, um, that, that's all right. Trouble, I'm having trouble with the finder uh, moving it around. It just changes the whole Ah, image, okay. Right? So, so, so if you're, it, Sometimes if you're zoomed in, it's a little hard to do it at first. So you, so if you zoom back out, oops, sorry. You, under this zoom thing, you can zoom back out. The, you see how, Like I find the easy things to match are this bright star here in the left of the image, and then that little um, set of four stars to the right of the image. So going there, right there. And so there's the two comparisons. And you can get the circles close with the finder on and then turn the finder off to make it better. So here's So you're looking for a little curved line of four stars and you want the purple circle on the bottom of the four. And then to directly to the left there's the bright star that's the target. And then up and to the right is the other comparison star. You might also look for this line of four stars here, right, in the image. It's all about pattern matching. Once you get the pattern, you're in the right place. Does that help, Bramlin? Yes, and I just, I couldn't, yeah, with, yes. Okay. So I'm gonna go to the graph brightness tab because I've, I've calculated my data. And when I go to graph brightness, see this graph brightness tab right here. There's my point, right? I was back here. The point was at 1.01868. Brian, yours is at 1.00103. Well, there's mine at 1.0187. But if I click my group, aha! This is all the measurements you guys are doing. Here's Planet Hunter 5, Planet Hunter 30. I signed in as Planet Hunter 30 earlier. Planet 120, I, that's me. Mary D, that's me as a teacher. Planet Hunter 11. Oh, no, Planet Hunter, yeah, 11. Excellent. That's me. Okay. Plan Hunter 11, Plan Hunter 11. I don't know what you're doing here, Erica. I could ask a quick question. I don't know why that was too raw. 
Yes. Uh, how how do you get rid of the finder? I, I opened it and now it doesn't want to go away. Yeah, there's a little X up in the top of it. See right uh, here. See this little X? If you look oh, I it. see. Okay. Oh, okay. I see now. Thank you. So you can always click it on and click it back off. Okay. So we're starting. Did my data at, come through? Uh, what number are you? I was one. Yeah, I'm not seeing in plan. And under. I didn't see it, but I grew. I see plan under 11, 11, 1, 1, 5, 30, 30, 30, 30. Oh, let me refresh the page here. And oops, sorry, that means I have to go back. Brightness, my group. Oh, now we're talking. Look at this. Planet Hunter, Mary B, Mary B. Hunter 11, 11. What time Planet Hunter 3 is in there? Planet Hunter 5 is in there. All right, Rob. Nice. Planet Hunter 7. Nice. Whoever Planet Hunter 7 is, you've got a great point in there. Now, I, I just want to know, are you guys seeing, uh, you, do you think you have a pattern here or not? This is pretty, um... <laughs> right? Do we think we see a dip in the brightness or not? You might try another, let's, we can all try one more um, image. And uh, especially somebody who might have had the later times, the 11 o'clock or the 10 o'clock hour, if you could make a measurement towards the end. So if I go, I think I have here, here, I have, this is my latest, but I don't think that's, so I'll go to that one. So when you go to your next image, Need you to be looking at my screen at the moment. The pattern will still be there, but the telescope moves a little bit. So the software, our tool saves that pattern, but, but it's not centered on the um, stars anymore, see? There's a way I can get it centered on the stars. If you select all five regions with the select all regions tool, you see it's now selected the target, the two comparison star measuring circles and the two points of night sky measuring circles. Now I can use my little arrows because I happen to remember that the bottom of this curve of four stars should have that purple circle around it. So I got to go down. I'm clicking down, getting my whole set of circles to get to. I get it over that star. And nicely enough, the uh, because the pattern is saved right now, I have my three uh, circles. Um, I don't know, since I refreshed, it probably won't calibrate. Ugh. All right. Well, heavens. All right. Let's go back. Back to the dark one. Sorry. Did I say that was the last one in my list? It was. There it is. If you don't calibrate, it's okay. You could still take, you could still calculate and record. 
And now I'll go to graph brightness. Oh, now we have a lot more data. Several of you have taken a couple measurements. So here's the one I just took. Yeah, we really need the 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock hour to fill in because it looks like a lot of you have data. All right, this is great. You guys don't have to do any more measurement because I think we're gonna, I, I wanna show you what we've got here, okay? Um, it would really help if we had more measurements between 10 and midnight. Um, uh but you can do those later uh so we want to um kind of try and interpret and see if we like if i looked at this i could uh uh convince myself that the dip is during this hour between 8 and 9 p.m and and maybe here there was no transit but i don't know how many of you believe that that's actually happening here i'm not getting any indication all right i think we need to uh, what do you think <laughs> this is yeah. our first time looking at it. yeah so it's your first time so let's go to interpret and share here where it says interpret and share this button okay i'm going to click on that all right. And under your data, you'll see HAP P32 from December 6th. All right. And here's our data. If I turn, I can turn off the group. I Planet Hunter 15, I only made two measurements, one way over here and one way over here. Now notice that in the interpret and share graph, all right, here's Planet Hunter 3, Planet Hunter 3, Planet Rob, Planet Hunter 11, I guess that's Erica. Planet Hunter 1, there you are, Bronwyn. Great. I found I found your I found your your point. Excellent. All right. So Here's, here's, our, here's our points. Kind of hard to figure out if we've seen a dip or not, but let's view when the predicted transit was. Click on view predicted transit. Ah, hmm. This is, this is a little hard here, yeah. Well, let's view a reference graph, which is a graph of what the of other observers who have looked at this star. So if I view reference graph, yeah, so it's a little hard to tell here to me. It looks like if we had more people measuring the first couple hours, and we definitely need more, um, we definitely need more measurements over here to see if we've detected that transit. I mean, we definitely have a bunch of low points here. For any of the stars for that, for the for the evening, you have to really do all of the. Do you recommend we do all of the um, times and all of the? Well, the more uh, you can see here, that the more data, the better, right? And in fact, I'm going to quickly myself while you're watching here. I'm going to go measure a bunch of stars in this uh, 10 and 11 hour. And since I'm pretty good at it, I'll do it quickly. You can watch. We'll we'll add them up here. So. Let me go back to measure brightness. Um, I, I actually, I need to make sure I have the 10 and 11 hours. So let me make sure I have the last two hours. So 10, let's get all of that. And then let's get all the 11 o'clock hour in my, in my um, 
thing here, 11 o'clock. Whoops, sorry. 11 o'clock, let's get all of those. Okay. And then I'm gonna go measure those last images here. Now we'll go, they're the ones way at the bottom of the list in the 06 hour, all right. So, and I'm not even gonna calibrate them so I can go a little faster, so. Mary, I've done a couple of them as well, so. Oh, excellent, thank you, Erica, all right. So we'll put this down here, this goes here, this goes here, and these go here. And once you start to recognize the pattern, you can get much quicker at it. And calculate and record. It's a little better here. Wait a minute. And Mary, if you want something faster, if you want to log in as the as your email, uh, I already uh, tricked the system to actually show you the graph of one of the users that did a great measurement for the Happy Theory too. Okay. Um, all right, so you, you want me to log in as me? Yeah. Okay, so we'll... we'll yeah, if you just wanted them, like just show the graph how it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to go to interpret and share, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Are you looking at my screen? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we are. Okay. Interpret and share. Oh. Oh, I see. You have me as somebody else here. My. I uh, yeah. Uh, you guys didn't see this. <laughs> Ah, uh, so here's somebody else who measured the same data set. So you could see they have uh, kind of a more, they did all this data at the last hour, couple of hours, and they did a lot more in the first hour. So here, you can see it's definitely a little more convincing, right? Yeah. So our data set is uh, a little messy, but we're first timers. So of course it's a little messy. Um, and uh, if we go back to, I think I have, yeah. Oh, can I do this? No, because you've done this tricking thing. Uh, yeah, okay. you can log out and log back in if you want and you will get back to your account, sorry. Okay. Uh, I think we were getting there. I mean, we just needed some more data points. Yep, yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. So um, let's do... And then Mary or Erica, where does this data reside and who looks at it after? Ah, this is our final thing here. So your data can contribute to refine, refining the predictions of when these planets actually transit. And um, the, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so now we're, we are. This is our group data, right? And, um, right? So 
we're kind of in the ballpark. It's just that we haven't measured enough points. Right? And it's a little messy because it's our first time. So we aren't getting the circle exactly centered over the three stars. We're, um, in fact, if we, if, uh, yeah. So, so uh, I, you know, this is pretty good for a first time, first time data set. This is not, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in there. But as you get better at using DIY Planet Search, your uh, observations can contribute to refining the timing. Because even in, even in this very good data set, if you look at when the predicted transit is, you can see this transit actually happened to me. It happened about 15 minutes earlier than the parameters that we have embedded in the software say it should have happened, right? So it turns out that Rob runs a project that um, is, uh, so this is our, our hat P32. Rob runs a project that uh, where you can contribute your micro observatory data, or if you have your own telescope data to help NASA refine those predictions of when these, exactly when these um, planets are gonna pass in front of their star. Uh, and I, I, do we have time for him to just show you that briefly? Yeah, I think so. Okay, Rob. All right, <clears throat> let me turn back on my camera and share my screen. So you've learned about uh, transiting exoplanets and how we can discover and characterize these planets using large space telescopes. And then you learned on microobservatory how you can do this on your own computer using an awesome web interface. So I'm here to talk about um, the citizen science project I'm running that actually leverages data from small telescopes such as the microobservatory. So as you remember, uh, the transit method is currently being used by the Hubble Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope in the next few months will be doing the transit method as well, as well as future missions beyond that. But in order to observe a transit to characterize the planet's atmosphere using Beer's law, you have to know very precisely when that transit occurs. In other words, you need to keep things fresh. So let's say I write a telescope proposal to get some James Webb time. And I look up on the internet and the internet tells me that the next transit will happen here in dashed red. Well, Let's pretend that there's some uncertainty with the timings of this transit. It actually does in real life, it actually comes a little bit earlier in black or even perhaps earlier than anticipated in these smaller shaded gray regions. And there's two ways to combat this. One way is to just increase my observing window so I have more baseline to ensure that I observe this transit. Another option though, um, that option is great about increasing your baseline, but that's not really using your telescope very efficiently because you're just waiting for that transit to occur. So let's say there is a specific target and it has a five minute uncertainty on its transit time. That's an extra five minutes that I have to add into my observations to ensure that I see that transit event. Now, five minutes doesn't sound like a lot, but on missions that are observing hundreds, if not a thousand planets, that starts to add up really quickly. And that goes to minutes, hours, sometimes even days of time that's wasted on these telescopes if you were to observe these targets and wait for their transits to occur, which ultimately means you know, you're wasting these very precious resources that could be doing other cool science. So you have to keep these mid-transit times fresh. You have to give telescopes these very accurate uh, predictions of when the next transit event will occur so you can use the telescope as efficiently as possible and you can enable to do as much science as possible. And by working with Mary and her group, we were really amazed about the data quality that was coming out from the microobservatory. These are these six inch telescopes that have been operating for the last uh, decade plus out in Arizona and Massachusetts. And they're really making awesomely science grade observations. Here's actually another data set of HAP P32 um, that was taken a few years ago by the microobservatory. And we're able to analyze and reduce these images and make some measurements about the transits of this target. 
And these are science grade light curves. And I can say that because we actually published microobservatory data in a paper that we published last year. So this got us thinking, if you can have a single robotic six inch telescope, you, know, you can actually get people around the country and around the globe using their own small telescopes to help us observe transiting exoplanets, to basically whittle down and constrain those mid transit times. And then you can contribute to, directly to NASA missions by helping NASA know when to look at these targets. And that caused us to start this project called Exoplanet Watch citizen scientists monitoring transiting exoplanets. Our website's right there at the bottom, but I'll come back to this. Um, if you forget the URL, you can also just Google it. Just type in NASA Exoplanet Watch, and we're hopefully at the top review from that. So as I've mentioned, Exoplanet Watch is a campaign aimed at citizen scientists to routinely observe high priority transiting planets, planets that are likely to be observed by James Webb, by Hubble in the future. And this is a very collaborative effort with the rest of the community. We have open collaborations with other groups as well and meant to be completely complimentary. Um, what's really cool about this project is that all the data will be immediately public to the entire community. There's no proprietary phase. As soon as your observations are contributed to our project, typically within 24 to 48 hours, they appear on our website. There's also an opportunity for community feedback and target requests. And the thing that I'm most excited about is if you contribute an observation and it's cited in a paper, we're requesting that the authors of that paper offer to make you a co-author on their published results. In other words, if you do the work, you deserve the credit. And just like Microobservatory, we're part of NASA's Universal Learning, and that is how we're funded over the next few years. So we have two goals with Exoplanet Watch. First is our education goals to engage the public in exoplanet science uh, and increase their confidence about their ability to do science. And in doing so, we actually establish and uh, actually uh, achieve a lot of goals in the exoplanet community that are actually very much needed. And that's uh, most importantly, in my opinion, which is to ensure the efficient use of large telescopes. This project also will help discover new exoplanets through confirmation observations, uh, monitor for stellar variability, and confirm new exoplanets as well. So let's just quickly run through the user experience. So first off, you plan your observations. There's a variety of tools we actually uh, provide on our website. We publish high priority targets every single night for every US time zone, but you're welcome to observe any exoplanet target that you want. It doesn't matter. We'll take data on every single target that we can get. And you can use tools such as the Spotmark Transit Finder or the NASA Exoplanet Archive to help you plan your observations. And as a heads up, I do have uh, links to all these tools on our website as well. Then you go out and do your own observations. You can use your own telescope. You have a scope as small as four inches. We're finding that those can actually do uh, science grade observations that we need for our project. Um, alternatively, you can actually get some data on the microobservatory. We're starting to uh, slowly lend out some sample data sets to our users. So if you currently don't have data, you can actually join our collaboration and join our Slack channel. And then we make routine calls about giving away data for free. And you can use the DIY planet search tools to reduce your data, or you can use other tools as well that I'll talk, you know, be talking about in a second. But by the end of this calendar year of 2022, we're sort of focusing right now on amateur astronomers and professional astronomers. But by the end of 2022, we'll be opening up to everyone and anyone and um, getting out robotic telescope data to all of our audience. So if you don't have your own scope, you'll still be able to participate in this project. Then you actually analyze or reduce your own data. So you take your own observations and you also have that first personal connection to your data. So just like what we did with the DIY planet search, <clears throat> where you have that hands-on way of picking out your target star, picking out your comparison star, your sky areas as well, to make that light curve that we saw of Happy 32, you can use that tool to actually participate in this project. Alternatively, we have our own data reduction tool called Exotic, which basically automates all those steps that we just went through uh, that Mary stepped us through. So it takes your raw images and produces a science grade light curve um, that you can actually immediately publish in a paper in as little as four minutes. So I think it's the fastest data reduction tool out there, which is pretty cool. 
Alternatively, um, you can use whatever data reduction or analysis tool you want to. So I know a bunch of folks love Astro Image J. There's some other homegrown ones as well. Doesn't matter as long as at the end of the day, you have your data in the correct format to upload the AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. They have an exoplanet database that they have very kindly allowed us and our users to use for free. So you observe your own observations, you analyze your own data. If you use exotic, it actually makes that upload file for you to upload it directly to AAVSO. So we try to automate it as much as possible. Then once you publish or upload your observations to AAVSO, you sort of sit back, relax, hopefully you get published, or you can also go on our website to look at any of our data. And there's nothing preventing me from from preventing you actually from going to our website right now and uh, writing your own papers about our data products as well. The only thing we ask in return is that you credit the appropriate astronomers, you add in a little acknowledgement section to your paper, and then you cite our paper as well. Sort of happening behind the scenes, we have this pipeline at JPL called the Citizens Pipeline. It's an acronym, it's not misspelled. I forget what it means. It's too early out here on the West Coast, apologies, I don't have enough coffee. Um, but what it does is, is these two servers that go out and they scrape the AAVSO's exoplanet database uh, every other night right now. And it downloads all the data. It reprocesses all the data just to make sure any values have changed. It also has a little bit more robust fitters. And then it immediately publishes all of that data to our website. And there is no proprietary phase. It's all immediately publicly available for everyone. So I talked a little bit about Exotic. This is our Exoplanet Transit Interpretation Code. This is the official code released by Exoplanet Watch. You don't have to use it to participate, but it's um, it was built specifically for this project, so we like to think it's pretty good. And it makes science grade light curves. Also, there's that field of view plot that we just saw as well for HAP P32. So this should look very familiar to everyone. Mm -hmm. Another cool thing that it has is that if you're out at a star party and you want to observe a transit, well, transit observations, full disclosure, are really boring. And when they're boring, it's good. That means things are working. <laughs> but it's also boring in the sense that you're observing a star for about five to six hours, and you're watching it dim about 1%. And to the human eye, that just looks like the same star image over those entire six hours. But Exotic, we have this real-time data reduction tool. So it actually shows you a, a, very, a sort of crude, uh, quick analysis of your data in real time. So if you're at a star party and you have your telescope set up and you want to observe a transit, you could have on your monitor this plotting it out in real time. So you can point to someone passing by, look, we're observing an exoplanet hundreds of light years away. And uh, that's kind of cooler to see than just seeing a few images. So you can still do science and still blow the minds, hopefully, of anyone that's walking by your telescope at the time. This is actually built off a tool that we use at Palomar Observatory to make sure we're observing the right target at the right time as well. So that's really a sort of thousand foot uh, overview of Exoplanet Watch. We launched about three to six months ago to amateur astronomers. You can contact us at exoplanetwatch at jpl.nasa.gov or visit our website exoplanets.nasa.gov forward slash exoplanet hyphen watch or just Google us NASA Exoplanet Watch and we should hopefully be one of the top, uh, top results there. And you can take a look at our website um, the best way to get in touch with us is by emailing us, but also you can sign up for our free Slack workspace. That's how our entire community uh, keeps in touch with each other and sort of helps each other out to make a, a very successful um, collaboration. So hopefully we'll see some of you on there soon. And otherwise, thank you so much for your time and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Rob, Mary, Erica. Do we have any questions? I have a question. Uh, so do, do we like divvy up dates or do we just arbitrarily pick a date and time to do that analysis we just did? <clears throat> so, so you can, um, in the DIY planet search interface, you 
can um, analyze any of the uh, stars that are available to you in that calendar interface. Rob for Exo, Exoplanet Watch, there is a, um, I mean, any, <laughs> Any target you you collect data for, almost uh, they're happy to have uploaded into the uh, AAVSO database. So so in that sense, yes, if you if you know a little bit about what targets are visible to your telescope and and um, uh, any any data set uh, is usable for that citizens pipeline to. Um, Kind of refine it and 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 um, analyze. So I think like I think Rob is anxious to get any uh, exoplanet data that people collect within DIY Planet Search. We give you a lot of support by scheduling uh, uh, hot Jupiters and hot Jupiters that are likely to be targets for future space telescopes that are looking at those atmospheres to try and and look at those atmospheres. So we um, have and are continuing to add targets that are high priority targets for um, Rob's project. Did that answer your question, Brian? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm taking it. A lot of this is new to me, so it, yeah, I'm probably just not you know, understanding everything uh, yeah. correctly. But yeah, yeah, just trying to think for a moment here. Uh, so if we wanted to take the next steps, what would be the best thing? Well, I would go uh, you can go to DIY Planet Search to the um, the public version now, which as an individual you can collect a data set just as we did and do the do the. Um, there are several video tutorials that uh, I didn't walk you through, but that walk you through the th in kind of more detail than I talked about. I very much encourage you within the Measure Brightness tool to uh, watch those video tutorials. To, to get a little more accurate. Um, so uh, I think if you kind of familiarize yourself with um, that DIY planet search tool, then you uh, can read more about uh, exoplanet um, ob ob observing on the exoplanet watch site. I'd say that would be your next step. Okay, got it, thank you. Yep. What do you suggest for um, for us as a society, as the Natural History Society um, moving forward? I mean, do uh, it, have you worked? I mean, I think that you've worked with schools and classes to have this. I mean, would you suggest that now that we we kind of have where we can be ambassadors for the the program, or maybe set up our own kind of let's all get together and do some data? um together kind of a data party i mean is are those things happening well we'd love for that to happen absolutely bronwyn yeah yeah and and um you know to, it's it, it's hard especially in this virtual world to kind of get everybody uh, knowing what they're doing on their screen there but once once you know the pattern it's very quick to uh, um to make these measurements and you know as i look at this data set you guys did in the in the half hour that we were doing it um there's actually uh I, you know it's 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 not bad it's pretty good as these as these data sets go exotic would generate a a, a light curve for this i think so um <clears throat> it's uh, uh and so we'd love to see a museum hosting a data party, looking at a data set, you know, to do that kind of thing. Um, in 2022, one of the things we'll be working on uh, with Rob uh, is um, is a back end that more directly, once you get that uh, set of data that we just got, the graph we just got. That that create that puts it in the right form to upload it to AAVSO directly. So, well, that's great. Um, I know that we can uh, continue working, and we'll continue our dialogue with 
with you. And you, you know, I think that this was a, a great exercise. It is hard to give so many different people on their different screens and trying to do this at the same time. But I, I, I I'm pretty proud of us for, for, for getting, for getting through it and getting good yeah. data. Yeah. In fact, if I, if, if I look at the thing again, I have to say, and you know, um, Am I sharing? Wait, which which one here? Which screen am I sharing? That's the interface. My, or yeah, uh, we're I looking at my data. This, this one, yeah, that one. one. Yeah. Okay. So you know, I feel like the the data point that is that is throwing us off is this one right here from Planet Hunter Three. Rob, is that you, is that you Rob? <laughs> yeah. It happens. Because <laughs> um, otherwise, we kind of have this early in the data set. Actually, Planet Hunter 11 is having a little issue here, too. But um, That's me. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I'd say all the people in the group, this is great. You, you actually are getting the, uh, the transit. So. That's within the transit, Mary. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, this is great. Maybe maybe at a holiday party you could pull this up on a on a laptop and and have people do that or uh you know Brian, a, yeah absolutely brian when eric and i have done a fa diy family planet search workshop where we had parents and kids together at the screen now we were able to go screen to screen to help people recognize the pattern but within a half hour and the thing is the kids were really good at recognizing the star pattern and and then, and the, um, you know, we had generated that, that um, we did a lot of other activities around transits and modeling, you know, making models of how a star goes in front of a, uh, how a planet goes in front of a star and um, thinking about that. And, and uh, uh, but within the space of pretty typically when you're, once you know um, how to, do the aperture photometry within the space of a half hour, you can get your light curve with a group. Wonderful. And it's, and it's something um, non-political to talk about. So that's great. At an <laughs> upcoming holiday, holiday gathering. So it's safe, it's safe to talk about exoplanets. Um, let you do that. But now we have the knowledge and talk about the James Webb and all that good stuff. So. Awesome. But they, so thank you uh, to um, Eric and Mary and Rob and Aladdin um, for, for sharing this with us. Um, now you've passed the torch on to us and we're gonna see if we can't get some more good data out there and push that, uh, push our knowledge frontier forward. Absolutely. And if any of you want to um, contact us, you have questions, I think, um, uh, Rob gave you a URL for the Exoplanet Watch, but you can use microobservatory at cfa.harvard.edu and all of us on the team, Aladdin, Erica, or I, or our telescope engineer will, will get that. So I'll type it in here. Microobservatory at cfa.harvard.edu. So if you try if you try the DIY planet search, you have problems, feel free to email and we'll figure it out for you. And I just Great. want to say I put the, the current site that you guys were testing under the firewall again. So that's not the live site. The live site uh, should be under our splash page. So if you want to try it on your own, that would be great. Thank you. You'll go to microobservatory.org and click on the DIY Planet Search that's there. And you'll have and, to create your own account. And you'll have to create your own new account because Planet Hunter 3 won't work anymore. Oh. All it's right, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for joining us um, and uh, have a, a wonderful rest of the, the year. We'll see you in 2022 as we uh, pick up with more Community Science Saturdays. Um, and, and stay tuned because we might get together and do some star you know, data parties, exoplanet parties. So uh, we, have, we have new things to do together.
Uh, thank you all so much. Stay well, stay curious, and uh, take care. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you this was really interesting. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.